Uh, welcome. We're delighted to have you here this morning um, to, and to partner with the CEC and the Chief Executive Council of Madison to offer this program. Uh, this is our fifth uh, leaders, emerging leaders luncheon, um, and it's a great program for our kids. They get to have an opportunity to speak with execs, listen to execs about their career path, um, and hopefully somehow, somewhere down the road, this uh, sets you up for success. Um, we've had tons of positive feedback from our students. It's a program that we would like to continue for as long as we can. I certainly would like to welcome and thank our execs, Dennis Bowen and Maureen Beeson, giving up their time to be here to, to share uh, their experiences with you. Certainly want to thank Mayor Connolly, uh, the Board of Education, uh, President Lisa Ellis for the support of this program. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy it very much. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Mayor Connolly. Good morning, everyone. Great to be back here. I'm a uh, member of the class of 74, Madison High School, proud member. At the time, this was G56. It shows that class numbers don't go as far as they used to. Uh, <laughs> uh, just a quick little story about the Chief Executive Council for Madison. Um, in a little write-up we had for today, talked about the fact that just about three years ago, I was new on the job as mayor. At the same time, Dr. Vivian Bull was relatively new as president of Drew University, and Steve Rakowski was new as the CEO of Quest Diagnostics. And um, the conversation started a softball game and extended from there. We talked about the value that you could get by getting executives together, working in three different angles. One was to give back to the community. Two was to help develop businesses in Madison, attract new businesses to Madison to uh, strengthen our economy. And three, which has probably become the most valuable part, is work to develop tomorrow's leaders. And that is what this is about. I have sat in on these sessions and um, I was never a good note taker, but I, I would recommend this is the time to take notes because you're going to learn a whole lot from our executives today. And then the opportunity <laughs> to ask questions is truly valuable and a little networking time at, at the end. So thank you for coming out and giving a little, take a little break from your studies to do this. And uh, you will learn a lot that will pay dividends for many years. And I want to thank Dennis Noreen also for coming out today to give your time. Christy, for again facilitating this. So thank you all. Okay. <laughs> On that note, thank you so much, Mayor Connolly, and thank you, Principal Robertson, and thank you, students, for being here today. Uh, my name is Christy Tai. I'm Education and Training Specialist at Junior Achievement in New Jersey. Junior Achievement in New Jersey is a nonprofit organization. We are actually a global organization, um, and we've been around about 100 years to teach students about entrepreneurship, financial literacy, and work readiness. Uh, here in New Jersey, we are uh, set to reach about 55,000 students across the state with our program. Uh, our programs are unique because they're designed to be delivered by a volunteer, so we'll put people who are leaders in their business or in their community in a classroom or out in their workplace with young people, and we make connections like that. So it gives students an opportunity to learn and outside of what they're learning in the classroom and to put some of those classroom things to practice so you can be more prepared for, for your, your future, for your future and your economic success. Um, so on that note, again, thank you for being here today. Uh, we'd like to welcome two of the top executives here in New Jersey. I'm so thrilled to have you both here today. Um, this morning, before uh, the high school students got here, um, Dennis mentioned a little bit about networking um, and the importance of networking in order to prepare yourself for a career. Um, networking is the best way to meet people and to learn about opportunities that might be available to you. Um, so what, the, what we're going to do today is we're going to learn from our executives and then at the end of the day we're going, you're going to have the opportunity to practice your networking skills, meaning you can ask questions and then at the end we'll have some informal kind of networking opportunities for you. So if you have a question at the end of the program and you didn't get a chance to, to ask it in our, in our general session, you can approach uh, our executives at the end and maybe have a conversation that way as well. Uh, so on that note, that's going to be the format of our program. We'll hear from them a little bit, and then we'll turn it over to you. You can ask your questions, and then we'll have that informal networking team. So I'd like to introduce again our two executives we have today. To my right is Noreen Beeman. She is the CEO of Brinker Capital. The Chief Executive Officer of Brinker Capital, Noreen oversees the strategic direction for the $17.5 billion investment management company. 
Previously, she served as the firm's chief operating officer. Noreen has more than 25 years of investment experience working with financial advisors and institutional and high net worth investors in strategic planning and investment management. Noreen is a graduate of St. Peter's University and is a member of their board of trustees. Please welcome Noreen Beeman. And to Noreen's right, we have Dennis Bone. He is uh, the Montclair State University Business School Director of Entrepreneurship. Dennis was president and CEO of Verizon New Jersey for 12 years, from 2000 to 2012. He also served as co-chairman on Governor Christie's 2009 Economic Development Transition Team, which led to the formation of Choose New Jersey. Dennis is a 1973 graduate of the West Virginia University Institute of Technology. He holds the Master's of Business Administration degree in Finance and Economics from Rutgers and a Master's of Science degree in Counseling from the Johns Hopkins University. Dennis and Noreen are both residents of Madison. Welcome, Dennis. So now we'd like to learn a little bit more about both of you, so I'm going to ask you a couple questions, and Noreen, I will start with you. Okay. If you could please share with our students uh, a little bit about your organization, uh, what your role is in your organization, um, maybe some of the key challenges and opportunities facing your industry, um, career-related opportunities. I'm sure our, our students are always interested in uh, what careers are out there. And uh, anything about your own per, uh, personal career path, um, some of the lessons that you learned, and some of, words, some of your words of wisdom like, you'd like to share with us here. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you guys for coming and um, sharing your lunch time. I don't know about the Jewish students. They didn't give you the memo on the lunch. So, um, <laughs> but fortunately, they'll have time after. So thank you for having me. Um, it's really great for me to have an opportunity to come to the high school. My two older girls have been graduates, so I would never have come when they were here because they would have been like, Mom, really? Um, so they were like, Mom, don't go on too long. I'm already going on too long. But Brinker Capital. Um, so Brinker Capital is an investment advisor. Um, we're located in Berlin, Pennsylvania. We manage currently $18 billion. Um, we serve over 40,000 clients and 3,500 financial advisors. We have 150 employees. Um, the, the story about Brinker Capital that's exciting is that we started as an independent organization, bought ourselves in 1991, and there were eight of us, and I had the opportunity to be a part of this group of eight. The six of us are still there, and we had $100 million under management, and of which one was a client of $60 million. And I worked out of the house. And in 1991, many of you were not born, um, and technology was not what it is today. So working out of the house was a different experience than it is today. But been able to grow the business pretty significantly over those 20 years, and my role has changed. I came out of public accounting, so I started off as I'm a CPA, so I was doing the accounting um, for Brinker, CFO. It was a very big title. We didn't have a lot of money, um, so it wasn't a very hard job. Um, and the guy before me that had um, worked with Chuck Widger, our founder, was really bad, so I just had to be better than he was, so fortunately I was, but I was not the best accountant in America. But I had migrated and took a lot of different roles. Because we were small, I had an opportunity to raise my hand a lot. Always had to do that first job. Always had to make sure I did the real job I was hired for. But I always raised my hand for other projects. And then that allowed me to have opportunities not only in, I started with doing some compliance, then it was working in our operations area, as well as I did sales. So for 1999 to 2004, I spent that time out with financial advisors that we serve and selling breakers programs. And that really set me up to have the opportunity to become the CEO, I think. Because when you have to talk about your products and talk about the services you offer, you really get to learn those. And that wasn't not an easy experience, um, but one that I, I, I took on and I learned a lot from. Um, I think Christy has heard the story. I had my biggest failure during that time. Um, you know, you let your CFO out and she makes an agreement on a handshake and nobody was watching me. And I, um, I really put the firm in, in, in jeopardy at that time. And I was at the on vacation, and this, um, Chuck, which our founder, calls up and says, you need to come home, and you need to fix it. And the story would have been easier if he had fired me. But he made me fix the problem. I had to go face up to the fact that I should have had it in the contract, face up to the fact that I need, now needed to unwind something, and then I was put in the penalty box for about, I would say, two to three years. But I, I, what I realized is that I just had to work harder. 
And um, people still talk about it today. Oh, remember when you did that? I'm like, seriously, I did that 10, 15 years ago. Oh, yeah, but you did it. I'm like, yes, I did. Um, and I was the salesperson of the year, the year I did it. And I keep that um, plaque in my desk because it keeps me humble. And I see it when I open up to get a pencil or a post-it. And I'm like, oh, I remember that I did that. Um, but the a real challenge is now as a CEO, so I grew up at Brinker. Um, so now we're making changes. So you, you migrate from a small company to a medium-sized company. And as an independent investment advisor, we're one of probably the top 10 in the country. Um, we serve clients like could be your parents or could be people you know, individuals with their IRAs that were, you know, average account size of 250000 That could be a lifetime of their savings. And our job is to make sure that we protect and grow it working with those financial advisors. And then we have some other clients with a lot more money, um, whether that, and then sometimes it's philanthropic in the sense that they create this wealth so that it can go back into organizations to fund some places like it's not for profit. So our job is to grow those assets so that you can continue, so money becomes energy. And a lot of times when you don't think about financial services, and I hope none of you saw that crazy movie, Wolf of Wall Street. That is not what we do. That is not financial <laughs> services. That I, it was a terrible um, indication of our future. And one of the risks to the financial services is that people don't want to work there because they see, oh, Wall Street. Oh, Wall Street. You know, all ills are not just on Wall Street. I mean, we think about globally, there's challenges in every industry, but we are facing a, a challenge on talent because people rather work at Google and AOL and Amazon, and they're going to work actually, so the talent pool becomes less interested in the financial services industry. So it's me as a CEO and looking for talent and making sure that we have the, the best and the brightest in our organization, um, we want to make sure that they understand that there's so many different responsibilities and roles. It could be marketing, it can be computers, it could be accounting. Like it's not just I'm an analyst. I'm not an investment banker. It's so many different things. So I could go on and on and I will not you want you guys to answer questions. But um, being the CEO is really um, probably one of the most interesting challenges. The first job I've had that I can't outwork. I almost could outwork every job. And it might mean that I was working hundred hours, you know, but I would if someone was smarter than me, but I I would always win because I would say, you know what? I'm going to outwork you. And I wouldn't always win, but, you know, I'm a little <laughs> high bet. But I would try to always win. And the real odd thing was I would do it because of my work ethic. But this job I can't work out work. And that has been a, um, I'm in my third year now. Um, and then what I had to really do is I had to trust my team, which I do. And the team is my job is to empower them um, and resource them to get the work done. And sometimes it gets a little challenging because I'm a doer. Um, and they tell me, please go out of the office. So they're actually glad I'm with all of you today and not bothering them. Um, but the reality is, is that the role of the CEO is much different than I had expected it to be. Um, it's a great opportunity. It's a wonderful role. But it's really more about the team and about others. And, um, and that's been part of the opportunity. Excellent. Thank you so much. It's a couple of really great things, I think, that you mentioned. Um, First of all, it's fresh in my head about being a good leader means empowering others. And so often we forget that, and that's so important. When you are in a, in a leadership position, your job as a leader is to empower others, and that's what makes a great leader. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, also, how you, you raised your hand for other projects as you were you're, um, going up in your career and in your business. Um, you weren't afraid to try something new. You weren't afraid to say, I'll do it. And that's such a key such a key thing, I think, for young people to, to realize as well, that the more you say you'll do things, the more opportunities are created for you. So. You can't wait. <laughs> meritocracy, there's this vision that is a meritocracy that, you know, someone's going to notice all your good work. I'm not saying they don't, but if you don't raise your hand, you have to make your career. Um, you really have to do that. You have to do your first job well, though. No one wants you raising your hand if you don't want to do your real work. You raise your hand after you get your real work. <laughs> good point. Good point. Um, so on that note, Dennis, I'd like to uh, pass it over to you. If you could share a little bit about uh, your background, of course, Verizon and what you're doing now at MSU, um, some things that you've learned along the way, words of wisdom you want to share, and maybe a career advice for um, folks that might want to get into your field. Sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, the one thing I want to acknowledge in my career is uh, what a great job uh, JA does. I've worked with uh, Catherine and Christy on several projects over the years, and uh, just a fantastic organization. Um, I consider myself to be uh, literally one of the luckiest people in the world. Um, I, uh, I, I came from very humble beginnings. Um, 
You know, I grew up on a little farm down in West Virginia. Um, I, I wasn't filled with this work ethic thing that Noreen talked about. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll tell you what, anytime you look over a landscape of, of a lot of people, you can really see those who have their heads down and are working really hard. And, uh, and although their heads are down, they really stand out. Um, um, so I uh, started at uh, Verizon. Well, it wasn't always Verizon. It had a lot of other names that this uh, migrated over the years or evolved over the years. Um, I guess it was New Jersey Bell way back when. Um, and I started as an engineer, and I worked uh, my way up. Um, I uh, was promoted about every three or four years. Uh, a promotion would come my way. Uh, and part of that was by doing my job really well and by doing other kinds of uh, work within the company that, uh, um, you know, projects that would come along. And, uh, uh, and you know, then I found myself as president and CEO. I was the CEO of two, uh, two divisions. Uh, I came to New Jersey in 2000 when uh, Verizon was created. That's when actually we uh, merged with GTE and 9X and a bunch of companies to create Verizon. Um, and then sat in that chair for, for 12 years and led an amazing team. And the team is all about, I mean, I think the role of the leader is to empower your team, as Noreen said. Uh, and, and I know we're going to talk a lot about uh, leadership, but it's, uh, it's empowering them, uh, believing in them, having them believe in themselves, and then they will, you know, go the extra mile to, uh, to make things happen. But that was a very tumultuous uh, time because during that 12 years I was president of Verizon New Jersey, uh, you know, the whole landscape changed. Uh, we were a $4 billion company in, uh, in, uh, in 2000, and uh, probably about $2 billion of those dollars were coming from so-called voice services. And when I left in uh, 2012, uh, we were still, I don't know what we were, a $5 billion company or something. Uh, but the voice services were such a small part of that. I mean, the, your landline used to be the, the, you know, the company. And now it's voice data and video, it's BIOS, it's, uh, it's cell phones and, and all that, those uh, uh, devices that all of you have in your uh, pockets or in your purses. Uh, but that was a fantastic run for me, uh, billions of stories over those years. Um, and then uh, when I retired, somebody came knocking on my door, the president of Montclair, she's a good friend, and said, Dennis, I'd like for you to create this entrepreneurship center. And at first I told her no. Actually, I told her no for about five months because, you know, I just retired. I didn't go back to work. Uh, but that started growing in the back of my head. I'd find myself at night and think, okay, why is Babson, you know, the perennial number one entrepreneurship center in the, in the United States? Or what makes all of these entrepreneurship centers? Uh, and, and every night I would be spending two or three hours on my computer thinking about this. And I said, well, I guess that's a sign I should do it. So I was given a blank sheet of paper, and now I'm two years into creating an entrepreneurship center. Um, and that, uh, and like I said, Ron, you know, I'm just a lucky person to be able to have the opportunity to work with students, uh, to work with this whole rich ecosystem of entrepreneurs, uh, to uh, you know get our teams uh, inspired and, and on their way. Uh, so that's a lot of fun, and certainly get a lot of pleasure out of that. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, what you may not realize, those of you who aren't, who don't know Dennis as well as we do at JA, is that he seems like a very humble gentleman. You're actually probably one of the most well-known and well-liked first people in the state of New Jersey. So <laughs> it really is an honor to, to have both of you here. Thank you so much for, share, for sharing that. Would you mind, um, before we go into questions, can you share a little bit more about entrepreneurism? Um, I'm not sure if our students are, are really too familiar with the concept. Um, what uh, and entrepreneurism seems to be growing um, for young people. There seems to be more and more opportunities to be an entrepreneur. Um, can you share a little bit about a little bit about that? Can I start with a question? <laughs> <laughs> How many of you think you'll start your own uh, business sometime in your life? Five or six, seven or eight. That percentage is growing tremendously. You asked this question 20 years ago. Very few people would raise their hand. Um, and uh, we are seeing more and more students who want to do it. Uh, you know, the, uh, not to get too much into the detail, but basically we all live in this do-it-yourself economy, um, and there's projections that literally within 20 years that half of the jobs in, in the country will be 
uh, in the do-it-yourself economy. And that's because of all the technology and all the power that, that we can bring into our lives on our cell phone or in our office or, or wherever it is. Um, you know, and, and pretty soon we're going to be able to connect uh, through through using the crowd, if you're you know, familiar with crowdfunding or crowdsourcing and all of those things. You know, billions of people across the world with a, with a smartphone, so your audiences are just, uh, you know, a few clicks away, you know, everywhere. Uh, but students understand this. Uh, they, um, uh, they're into it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's enabled shows like Shark Tank and whatnot to, uh, uh, you know, to come along. But it's not glamour. You know, one, one of the things we do with our students is the mindset. Do you have the mindset to become an entrepreneur? Uh, and uh, we spend a lot of time on that. And by exposing students to other entrepreneurs, it's all about, you know, going down a path, failing, picking yourselves up, learning from that failure, uh, going again. It's long days, long nights, and, and a lot of work, uh, generally. So you'll see the, uh, the the Zuckerbergs or the the people who you know who cash out for you know billions of dollars, but you know just like uh, an NBA player, there's very few that make it to the NBA. But you know most people don't. Uh, but at the same time, there's incredible power and skills that you will develop life skills by going down that road. Uh, confidence, the power to choose. You know the biggest power that any entrepreneur uses that any of you have is your power to choose. You get up every morning and you choose, you know, what you're going to wear. You know, last night you chose whether you don't have to do your homework. So entrepreneurs use that power to choose and they focus on that so much um, in, in their lives. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so we've heard some really great things from our leaders today. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to you, um, students. If you have any questions you'd like to uh, ask to, to Dennis or to Noreen, we'd love to hear your questions. Who would like to go first? Oh, oh we have a roving microphone. Can I ask question? Don't everybody talk at once. I'll ask the first question. Uh, advice for juniors or seniors going off to college, and there's maybe some sophomores in here as well, what they should study, what they should be focused on. Uh, what you want to tell your kids that maybe they didn't listen to, but they might listen to you, they might listen to you here. Um, I think you need to um, follow your passion, and I think you need to try a lot of different things. So um, I started off in college as a political science major, and I ended up as an accounting major halfway through because I didn't want to pay for law school, but I never went to. So it was, I, you know, the reality is, is that as a sophomore, You've got to love learning, and grades are important. I, I, I you know, I, I always say to my kids, I'm like, you know, it's just how did it go? Did you learn anything? And then I don't want to be mean about the grades, but unfortunately, as you're judged to go into college, grades matter. So it's a reality. So I'm not going to say they don't matter, but it's the process of how you're learning to learn. It's your intellectual curiosity. So I would just be open to different experiences. That's why you take a lot of different classes that teach you whether or not you like sciences or you like math or you like English or you like history because that's going to bring you to a career that you don't know what it's going to look like. When you think of yourself 20 years from now, 30 years from now, let's hope we didn't peak in high school, right? Like seriously, I love like, you know, the glory days. If we look back and say we peaked in high school, oh my goodness, there's a lot of living after here. So you want to keep that intellectual curiosity. So don't lose the love of learning because you don't necessarily like physics. Um, embrace the fact that you don't like physics and do something else the next semester or the next year. But I would say open your mind to a lot of different opportunities and just embrace it as you're in it. Um, and then in college, I'm a big believer in a core curriculum because you get a lot of different ideas. It's hard depending on your major. But um, my, um, you know, talk about my own for one minute. My daughter Emily is a chemistry major but she's doing a business minor. And not, and we don't even know if that's really going to be her journey, but it's more about opening her brain and her mind to the other side of things that she had not really seen, and she's enjoying that. But she's also taking a piano class just for the pure love of it. She's never going to Juilliard. She's never going to be playing anywhere interesting other than maybe our living room. But I would tell you that's because of her, that brings her joy. And um, But my own personal experiences have been um, life is a process of continual learning, and once you stop, you're out of luck. But so I have loved the process of um, just being engaged in that. So as a sophomore, as a junior, as a senior, I would just keep your options open and just embrace each and every class that you take. Ditto. 
It's good to go first. <laughs> no, every, um, um, from my point of view, right on the money, especially the love of learning. Um, you know, all kinds of facts that knowledge doubles like every two years or something. When I went to college, uh, you went to college to get knowledge. You go to the library because that's where the information was. So you would check out a periodical or a book. You go to a cube and you would sit there and you would underline and you would write and you would do your reports and, and whatnot. Well, college is different. You're going into higher education is just changing so rapidly now. And where you're going is not where you go to get knowledge. You get knowledge off your cell phone. I can go online. Our, uh, MIT has open source. Every class at MIT, every class, not just a few, every class at MIT is online and free. So I can, you know, learn chemistry or physics or economics or business or whatever, you know, from uh, what MIT would say is some of the most notable scholars in the world. So that's not what college is anymore. Higher education is where you go to interact with each other and interact with the faculty. It's where you go to work in teams, to collaborate. Because the knowledge is the commodity. Everybody can get the knowledge. Uh, but how are you going to use that knowledge in the world, in your career? And again, uh, uh, you know, passion. There's so many people, I think, up front try to make mistakes. They'll go into college saying, wow, I want to become an accountant because I know that all accountants get jobs right out of college, which they do, by the way. But if you're not passionate about accounting, or if you don't see some, something in you that, that makes you want to be an accountant, you know, I certainly wouldn't recommend you go down that road. You know, if you want to, if you are, you know, you want to, you know, uh, get a degree in music, um, because that's your passion, you know, go for it. Because you don't know how that is going to be leveraged someplace down the road four or five years from now. Again, because it's all about collaboration. For example, our entrepreneurship team, I love when the music major and the chemistry major and the accounting major and the psychology major uh, become a part of a team. That becomes a really special team. And there's so much research going on into this area. So you could be a music major and end up you know, doing, you know, on a team with a bunch of other folks doing fantastic work. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. And on, on, while we're talking about colleges, um, those of you in the audience, how many feel like you're really not sure, even the college students, what you're going to major in when you walk to college? Are you kind of not sure? See, and that's okay. Does it make you nervous that you're not sure? A little bit, yeah. So, so important to note is that our leaders here, you started with political science. Mm -hmm and you ended up in financial services. Dennis, you're, you're, you have a degree in math, and now you're in higher education, among other things. So it doesn't, it doesn't always matter. You don't, you don't need to have a direct path, because it changes. You could, you could be on one path, and like you guys have said, new opportunities arise, and, and you find out what, you, what you're good at, what you're passionate are, what you're passionate in are, and you follow those new, those new roads. Always a really cool thing that this time comes up from our conversations. <laughs> um, any other questions from our audience? Yes, right here. So, um, you mentioned about diversity in the teamwork. On IOSA, we think it's really important to keep. But I do also believe it's quite tough to manage such a team. It can be really amazing, but I also think it can be really bad team. So, in that case, I'm just curious, like, what kind of difficulties that you've had through building a team and how you built, ended up building a successful, amazing team? Good question. Teamwork. How does it work? Uh, so I have entrepreneurship teams. Some, they get along fabulously. They are all working really hard. There's no slackers. Um, and they're doing amazing things. And then I'll have a leader of another team that says, you know, there's like two of us that's doing 90% of the work and there's two slackers on our team and, and whatever. And in my advice to them is kind of kind of a tough love advice, which is, well, this is what the real world's really like. Uh, everywhere you go, this is going to happen. So you need to work it out within your team. Uh, if you want to have an off-site session and, and invite me to become part of your team for a, an hour to uh, you know to talk candidly about some things, I'll do that. But the learning takes place 
within that team of managing that complex environment. Um, and you get to the leadership area. So a good leader, again, will will try to, well not will try to, will, will empower others by believing in them and understanding them. And sometimes if there are behaviors of team members not feeling included or something else, you know, that gets in the way. So, but it's, a, it's an important life lesson, I think, for teams to, to work it out, to confront their issues, to work it out. That's where a real learning takes place. I, I would 100% agree. Um, it's always a challenge in teams. And I think back, um, and when I got the seat I have now, all of a sudden, I'm no longer really on the team. I'm on the team, but I'm really, my job is to make sure the team functions well. And now is the first time I respect our founder, the CEO, um, former CEO, and I say to him, God, I was probably horrible around the table. Because I always thought my ideas were the best ideas. And so when you think about, you have all these type A's, especially as you move up in an organization, every single one of them think they're the smartest person in the room. And now all of a sudden you need collaboration. And I would sit there and look at some of the ways in which he would indulge one of the other professionals because he needed 75% of what that professional was delivering on the team. So the other 25% of nonsense, and I, you know, there's nonsense, right? A lot of shenanigans. He would forgive for the sake of the team. Um, but I had this great experience last two weeks ago. I was out at Ritz Carlton does a service level training. It's all about how they deliver unbelievable service excellence, ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. And they would bring in um, a team at the end of each day. And it wasn't scripted because they said some stuff that if I was in charge of them, I would be like, oh my God, <laughs> don't say that out loud. But this one woman, um, this housekeeper, who's Lily, who was lovely. And you have to remember all the different roles that are done at a hotel. So a woman who's in housekeeping, she's been working at the Ritz-Carlton and Marina Del Rey for 12 years, and what she said is we are not follow the leaders, we are collaborators. So what has been going on is the Ritz created a culture that every single person that works within the organization is empowered to be a part of the team, that she can make the stay, if you're staying there, better because of her, um, she's been heard. So team members usually fall apart when they don't feel heard. Um, when they don't feel respected. So you need to listen. Even sometimes I listen to crazy ideas and I want to shut it down in like 15 minutes, but I have to let them tell me. But then they don't feel disenfranchised. And I did a meeting yesterday with this one gentleman that he, who I he I used to work for. Now he works for me. So that's you never know, that much fun, right? Um, <laughs> and now I had a meeting. This is how I'm seeing it as a crazy team. The meeting invite said, we're doing it the way I want to. Now, in a million years, that every business book in America will tell you, do not add a meeting request saying, we're doing this the way I want to. And it was because of this one crazy team member. So then I had to call the three other ones and said, Tom, I'm not sending this to you. Don't be offended, but you know. Jen, you know. Like, I had to tell the other three I was not hurting their feelings because, of course, people were doing what I But the gentleman didn't even, I didn't hurt his feelings by that email. I spoke to him. So in speaking to him, he came, and then last night he showed me this wonderful... Thank you so much for your patience. We're going to win this. I'm like, okay, crazy. Put your crazy in a box and play with the other members better. But I, this is just, you have to know who's on your team and make it work. But it's, um, but then he actually brings a little extra spice to it, if you can manage. So. Yes. Thank you. Um, my question is around uh, ethics. Um, you know, as these folks enter the work world. Um, do you have an example of uh, when you've had to be courageous and do you have any advice for them in terms of how to filter sometimes even who you're working for or folks who are very senior to you who have an idea that, that either they know is not really doing the right thing or they don't realize is doing the right thing but in your gut you think it's not the right thing to do? <laughs> Um, so, um, ethics is, um, table stakes. I'm putting an extra point on that. <laughs> uh, if you don't have a culture in your organization that, um, that makes unethical behavior uh, that that doesn't tolerate it at all, 
then I don't think you have the right culture. And I've come across this many times in, in my career. Um, and probably that has led to any time where uh, I've been directly terminating somebody, it's probably over an ethical issue. Um, but there is, sometimes you get to a fine line under pressure of doing the right thing or not. Um, and, uh, you know, putting all your cards on the table with customers or, or something like that. Uh, but uh, you, you have to have a culture where there is a bright line that if you, if the, an ethical inside your organization or how your organization deals with the world, but if you cross over that ethical line, then there's consequences. And if that is known inside your organization, it makes it much, much better that it's simply not tolerated. And whether that's how you treat one another or, you know, how you treat the world, how you interact with the world. When you, all you have is your reputation and you need to guard it. You need to protect it. That's yours. Um, I'm a big believer in too good, no good. You know, like I always find it interesting when we present, you, you know, when you, especially in investments, usually everyone coalesces around the same outcome. And when somebody's outcome is so much greater than another, you have to say, what's not right here? I mean, what's not working? Um, but one of the things that I have had the opportunity of is having a, a wonderful culture within our organization that allows for open and honest communication. And we put the client first. And that's not always easy because, you know, sometimes you're writing checks because, you know, it would be easier to say, oh, let's not pay attention to that mistake and not write a $400,000 check. But you know what? We're going to write the $400,000 check because it's the right thing to do. And we may never make money on that one particular opportunity for the rest of our careers. But you know what? Our reputation matters. And the other thing is that I do not overreact when the problem actually happens. I might overreact before, it's like, why are we fixing this? Why aren't we doing this? But once it happens, when someone comes in to me and says, we did this, I have to be really calm, even though I might not feel really calm on the, out, you know, on the inside. But I think, okay, let's talk about it. How are we going to fix it? And if you do not allow for people to come into you, which they're going to feel like they're going to be, you know, being treated poorly or misjudged, then that's how you get around it. But it's really around, you have to just fix it and move forward. But you have to protect your reputation. And really, honestly, anything you see that's too good, no good, and you know it in your gut, ask some questions. But the other thing, too, sometimes you may think from your vantage point that it's not appropriate. That's when sometimes research matters. So you understand what it is. And you may be misjudging, like, hey, I thought, you know, and I've done that as a young professional over thought. I was in auditing. I did love auditing. didn't really love accounting. Um, and I'd be like, oh, my God, we found fraud. And then when you, you know, make a big to-do, and next thing you look in, you're like, oh, no, there wasn't anything to it. So I mean, you have to not jump to conclusions, but you should never feel that you're compromising your own personal ethics. But um, self-righteousness also doesn't play real well. It's more around, hey, I don't know if we're doing the right thing for the client. Let's rethink this. Collaboratively. Good, good answers. Good answers to that tough question. Um, and, and I like what you said about, about kind of establishing your own personal branding, your reputation. And it, it, it is very important to always have that about you. That's one thing that we can always, we should always try to protect. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Um, you spoke on this a little bit earlier before the high school students got here, but I was wondering if you could talk about it again because I think it's so important. Um, how difficult was it for you as a woman to be successful in the financial world because it is such a field that's so dominated by men? Um, so it's interesting is that I was very fortunate. Um, I, in public accounting, it was a little more challenging. It was 1986, so I'm really dating myself, guys. Um, and there wasn't as many women in the industry at that time. It turned, you know, they were like, ten years later. I met women the other day, and they're all partners, and it's fabulous. Um, but in our own little, we were in an entrepreneurial firm. We started, and it wasn't about um, whether you're a man or woman. It's like, well, could you get the job done? And it was, you know, just putting my head down and getting my work done. But I go into in, into a lot of conferences, and um, I'm one of four women. I like the one guy on that stage. Just got to get more girls here. Well, the last time I've been called a girl. <laughs> I'm like, okay. But um, seriously, like, and why is that a thing? Like, and I get invited to speak, and I, you know, even to all of you, um, and I, I'm going in this crazy magazine nonsense because I'm now like a freak. 
there's like a woman CEO in the financial services industry. That's like really like special. And I take offense to that, but I'm trying to turn that in the sense that I think your generation, the millennials, I love the millennials, are going to change that because it's going to be about your family and the way you want to live your lives. And you're not going to see that there should be the sexism. You're going to want to work in an organization that is run well, that creates opportunities. And whether it's a woman as the CEO or a man as the CEO, I, I think that line is going to change with all of you, like many of the other things that are changing because you guys are out there saying, seriously, why are we even thinking that? And we love our millennials, and we take your advice. The best commercial right now on TV is the, the young lady jogging with her dad. It's the Schwab commercial, and he's asked, she's asking questions that are investment advice, and she's like, is that really how you're doing it? And what that does generationally is a shift of, I really do take my children's advice. And I listen to them because I value it based on their experiences. So as a woman, it's really, it is an interesting 14% of our of about women CEOs in the country. I think that's going to change more because you have to represent the populations that you serve. Um, but I don't think it's something that should define us. Billie Jean King, Title IX, I, I, I encourage you guys to go back and look at Title IX because that has changed our lives in ways that people can argue change it badly, some at higher education may not like it. But I think for women, because men saw their daughters with ponytails running around a soccer field and they related to them in a different way. So when you came into the office, all of a sudden they had spent all weekend at an event. So Title IX has opened up doors for women in ways that we're not really thinking about. Um, but most importantly, Billie Jean King's idea of feminism was for boys and girls. I have a son. I don't want him to be discriminated against because my two daughters are now getting a fair shake. Like, that's not fair. I look at it as a family. and as a, I, So I think w that's why I think women have a oppor huge opportunity, and we have to stand up and own it. And I think you guys generationally would be like, really? That's a thing? So I'm hoping, I have a lot of hopes for the millennials, as you change our world to make it better, that you're going to sit back and say, God, really? That was a thing. So we'll see. Uh, any questions from the gentleman up at the top? We haven't heard a lot from the gentleman up at the top. Here. You guys are being awfully quiet. Any questions from, from the young men up at the top? Okay, well then we'll bring it back down to the young lady here. You had your hand up? And also, um, do you currently offer any internships at uh, uh, the company that you work at? So um, Brinker Capital does have uh, internships. So we're in Berwyn, Pennsylvania. So that becomes. So I live in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania. I've been doing that to you. I, I don't know why I never thought I was ever going to stay at Brinker, but I did. So because I got to do different things. So I um, I've been commuting a little over two hours to Pennsylvania, um, and now I spend a lot of time there. Um, so I was actually glad to be in Madison today. Um, but so we have a 15. We have 150 people. We have 15. In um, interns every summer, and we have a really, I think, a, a very good um, internship program. But I would tell you, my career path has, um, you know, I look back, I really love what I do, but I can't tell you that all the 20, 30 years I've been working that I've always loved it. And you might talk to me next week and be like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? But so I think it's ebbs and flows. Um, but what I have loved is the ability to um, take on new challenges and learn new things. I wasn't a person who was going to just sit back and, and, and not expand um, my opportunity set. So I was fortunate to work in a place that allowed me to do that and, um, and I can and take, take chances and take risks. And I, again, I have not been, you know, there's been very bad, uh, down and plain failures in this process. But it's how you take yourself up from them. Um, so I would say um, it's been fun. I mean, I, 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 and I, I keep thinking I want to go back to school. One day maybe I could be a teacher. You know, I want to be running out of time, an astronaut. Like, what else am I going to be able to do? And yet, it's like there's still time to go. So um, though Dennis works a lot of hours in his, his post job, I don't know if I would like that. Uh, quickly, I never considered my job a job. I considered, you know, it, that was my life. Uh, you know, so you would be, you know, you would be surrounded by, and again, creating the right culture, the right environment where everybody is rooting for everybody else inside your company. Um, then, you know, it, it's not a job. You know, the, sometimes even today in, in the entrepreneurial world that I'm in, you know, it's it's my identity, it's, it's who I am, it's my brand. You know, I, I do it because I love it. 
Um, you know, I get an email every two weeks that says, you know, your your pay stub is online or something. But you know, that I don't connect it to. It's not a job for pay. It's because who I am and what I'm doing. So I think we're almost done with this part of the program, but I just want to ask you really quick for our young people here. Um, you, you obviously both extremely successful in your field. So what is your what's your best advice? to our young people here as they go on to, to college and then to career. Best piece of advice. Don't worry about the money, <laughs> I would say. Right? Like, don't worry about the money. The money comes. Money is important. I said it earlier about internships. You take an unpaid one and go work, you know, at the quick check. Go bag groceries. If you need the money, you're going to find money now. But don't make investments about the money. There's times when I went part-time I have three children. I made as much money when we first started Brinker to get pay for the nanny and get pizza. We didn't have a lot of money. Um, fortunately, that has paid off. My husband's now retired. He said I was the best pink sheet stock, and that's penny stock that he could have ever imagined. Like it worked out for him. Like he, you know, hit the home run. He tells me, I'm like, seriously, that's what you got originally. So, um, <laughs> but the reality is, is having that. The, the money shouldn't define you. It's the opportunity to create something and be a part of something that you feel good about and to be learned. So I would, um, that would be my advice. And, 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 and really, internships and experience are things that you just can't take back later on. Like, they're part of who you are. I would say um, <clears throat> do what you like to do. Um, because it's I, I think that successful people, and, and you heard it from both Noreen and myself, is we work very hard. Um, and any time that you're in a, a corporate setting, anyway, uh, and you know, and the leadership is looking to say, okay, who are we going to groom for succession? You know, who's going to be our future leader? I mean, you want to be on that sheet at some point. So they look at you. They look at you. You know, how hard you work. You know your results. They look at your attitude. Uh, they look at your positive influence in something in, in, in the environment. Um, but if you think about it, if you hate what you do, then you're not going to want to work that hard. You're not going to want to be positive all the time and constructive all the time and, and all of that. So I think you have to like what you do. And sometimes you may have you learn to like what you do. You know what? You find yourself in a bad situation. We all go through cycles where we are working for just a horrible boss. Just a horrible boss. All out for himself or herself and really not about the team. And you say, why am I working so hard for this person? Now, that's a bad thing to get into that trap. Uh, the best thing to do is to say, okay, let me learn. Let me find something positive in the situation. I'm going to focus on the positive. I'm going to do put my best foot forward anyway no matter how bad that, uh, that boss is. Excellent. So put your best foot forward, look for the positive in any tough situation. Uh, certainly taking chances, taking risks is key. Um, and and you, you both said, find something that you enjoy. And it, it is more important than money. A lot of times that, that is our focus. You know, are we going to be able to, to, to pay for the things that we need? Are we going to be financially successful? But I don't think that that really comes if you're not enjoying what you're doing on the any last minute questions before we uh, before we take our group photo? Yes, right here. Can you pass the mic? Thanks. Okay. So, um, I was just curious what you guys think about the location of your college as well as like where you go and how uh, famous your college is or how presti like prestigious the college is or like how important it is where you go to your future? Good question. How important is your college to your future? So I went to St. Peter's in Jersey City. I lived at home, commuted, and I worked. Um, it worked out. So I think you should go to a college that you're going to feel that you can manage and afford. You should go to a college that you're going to challenge you. Um, you should, you know, aspire to the best opportunities that you can have. Um, you know, me as a parent, I did a three-hour radius of how far I wanted my children to go. Because I, and you know, again, I lived at home and went to college, so they both went away. But my thing is that um, 
I think you want to look at for school that's going to fit you personally. I mean, when you think about when you go on campus, um, and that's going to instill, because I think that's what Dennis said earlier, I'm now stealing your answer, um, is that your, the professors that are there, the collaboration, the teams, all those things, if knowledge is available anywhere, but it's really that collaborative environment that's going to inspire you to be a better learner and, and love learning for your future, I think that's the best thing. And you're going to present yourself through your experiences no matter where you go. That's who you are. Because 10 years later, it's more about what you've done than where you've gone. Now, your connections, I will tell you, no doubt, what I have learned lately is the networking abilities of where you went to school. Fascinating to me. Because I'm not a, I was not a big networker, and now I'm like, all of a sudden, that's my thing. Um, but that's a fascinating. So that does that matters. So the alum, the support of the alumni, like Drew has people come in and, and the alumni come back and they give back. That's a big deal. Um, I, I just read a little statistic last week that 27% uh, of the CEOs of companies, um, or the S and P 500, or or what, uh, but only 27% came from the so-called elite colleges, like the Ivy League and Stanford and you know the so-called elite colleges. So the point is, you can go to almost any school. Like I went to, I went to school in West Virginia. Uh, became a CEO. Or he went to St. Peter's. Became a uh, CEO. Uh, but it gets back to the networking. Some schools have a really good reputation for having fantastic uh, alumni networks uh, that really propel their, you know, the, the careers of their people. I would say that's as important as, as, as anything. And find a school that, uh, that, you, that you like, and you have to like it, uh, whether it's a huge university or whether it's a, you know, a small college uh, uh, town you know, in the Berkshires or someplace like that, something that feels like part of you. Um, but go to a place where you're going to engage and you're going to network, and it's going to be a place where you can shine. And of course, college is an opportunity for what you make of it. Yeah. From what oh, I see going yeah. there and doing a lot of great things. Excellent. Well, I'd like to thank our executives for being here today. Can we give them all a great hand for coming over? We have uh, a small token of appreciation uh, for you guys being here, and I'd like uh, two of our students, Chris Farrell and Jonathan Miller, to present that to you. Thank you very much. Um, just in, in wrapping up the, no pun intended, uh, the, the, the ceremony here, the program here, please make sure everything gets put away. Uh, I'm going to ask you to do that now, and then we're going to reassemble here in the seats, kind of move down and fill all the seats, and our two execs will sit in the middle so we can get a picture of this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Was it fun? It was fun. It was fun. Yeah, it was fun. I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much. You guys were awesome. Very, very important. Yeah. Yeah. I learned so much from you. And you know what? We've done this five times. Yeah, we did. But I'm like, we're getting on the side. These are similar, but different in ways, which I think is great.